So, and I think one of the things that you all discussed is the, I and mean, we talk about the very big difference between invention and innovation, which uh, cause I think a lot of the times this is a corrupted uh, couple of words, right, within our, within our industry. Uh, you all touched on it, but do, do we feel that the word itself is, is a problem because so many people are using it or misusing it? The metaphor I like is Bob Metcalf's from uh, one of the founders of Ethernet and again an MIT guy. You know, invention is a flower, innovation is a weed. Innovation is how things spread, how they diffuse. So I think there's no shortage of, frankly, great inventions. What I do believe is that there's an enormous shortage of clever, innovative ways of converting that invention, the novelty, into value, right. whether it be economic value in a business model sense or, or improved outcomes in a therapeutic sense. Mm. So, so I think there's a fundamental critical distinction between investing to invent and investing to innovate. ROI is return on invention and ROI is return on innovation. And I think it is absolutely fair to say that the 20th century Bell Labs, the great labs, the great R&D paradigm privileged, if I may be allowed to use that word, invention over innovation to their detriment. Mm -hmm to their detriment. And I think, I think the story of 20th century innovation oftentimes, and R&D, is, is that there was a diminishing returns on invention and the, six, the true success stories were the ones that emphasized innovation. And would you speculate that the pharmaceutical industry is replicating that mistake? I, I would say that on the industries ripe for disruption, pharma and healthcare is pretty high and that they enjoy, I mean, you look at what Amazon has done to retail, Apple has done to telecom, movies, video, although Apple has its own issues. Uh, you know, I think, and presumably we'll have this conversation as we go forward, but there's a thing, there's a barrier of entry that pharma enjoys, and that, of course, is regulation. And, and to a very large extent, the reason why pharma is not as disrupted as many people, including myself, would have anticipated, or healthcare and medical devices are not as disrupted as, as one might think, is, is that they really enjoy regulatory capture. And, and um, I, I, I think it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. To a very, one last quick comment. To a, if, if I wanted to be very, very cynical and very, very cruel, I think I could make an argument that a lot of what is defined as interesting innovation and interesting invention in pharma is gaming regulation, gaming the regulators, gaming the regulatory process, uh, succeeding at being regulatorily innovative as opposed to technically or business model innovative. Okay. And IP, right? A IP, exactly right. So I have a slightly different viewpoint on that specific to pharma. I hope so. Um, if, if we're defining innovation as the weeds, as the thing that spreads, the actual development and execution, I think that's actually where pharma, in that definition, really succeeds. I think that if you talk about taking a molecule through the clinic and then making it a drug with the highest chance of success, I think that time and time again, the top 10, top 15 pharma can show that the development side is something that they've really become experts at and can really develop all the way through. Ideation, though, is something that I agree needs to be done more so in pharma. More risks taken, more reward given to people who want to go outside of the box and do it. Right now, most of the ideation, in at least life sciences, you kind of look at institutes and universities and, and small me, biotech companies who, who do the ideation. To me, that's saying, you know, Defining pharma as molecules and compounds is like defining Google as code or Apple as code, design code, you know. I, I, I just flat out disagree. You look at something like TensorFlow, you look at something like Hadoop, it's a different kind of an environment. It's a different way of facilitating development and diffusion of innovation. You're creating an ecosystem, an environment. And I think pharma companies, both as businesses and, and as R&D, as, as, as incredibly rich, incredibly dense networks of, of human capital, I, I don't think of them as, as ecosystems yeah. in that way. I'm prepared to be talked out of that. I'm prepared to hear that J&J &J has a fantastic 
innovation ecosystem. Well, I was going to ask Robert, actually, because you've been tasked with creating under an innovation banner uh, an ecosystem. And he's an MIT guy, so he understands what an ecosystem is. But, but, but my, my, bet is at the board, my bet is that the board of directors of J&J probably doesn't have as rigorous a definition. They, they, might, in, they might inspire you, but uh, okay. let, let me share a couple of thoughts, at least uh, top of mind to react, to connect what, at least in my mind, resonates um, within the context of pharma. And I do think one has to be very careful to draw, to draw uh, rules from some of these things that spread too far because the framework from which they've evolved, they've grown into a, a set of boundary conditions that I think are in many ways are defined by intellectual property definitions and regulatory mm -hmm. uh, paradigms certainly have been actively involved in creating those. But the notion of discovery, the moment of when something gets discovered, I would say it's analogous to when something rolls off of a blockchain algorithm, right? All of a sudden, it, you've got one, right? Mm -hmm. You've been toiling along, and now you've got one, right? Mm -hmm. That moment, you know, and I think we do have to, as a, as a society and as, as an industry, continue to invest in the notion of that serendipity, you know, because it's gonna have to happen, and I hope we'll continue to uh, believe it can happen in lots of different places, should be, I would like to suggest, abstracted away from the kinds of things that should be now available to where might that discovery go, to be able to advance as swiftly as it might be to get to the point where you actually have an opportunity to believe it's true, to believe it's valuable, to believe that it actually... Yeah, but serendipity is a PhD word for luck. Yeah, it is. Well, there's okay. no doubt, but there's a huge amount. Not good enough for me. I just came from Las Vegas. I would like my odds to be better than well, serendipity. Well, I, I hope we'll, we'll all get to that someday, okay. but I will say it, it, I have no uh, true evidence that we've gotten tremendously better in all that we've done at being able to discover any more often the kinds of things that depend on biology. Right, this is still a deep and dark set of, uh, of uncertainties that are inherent really? in our... You really think that? Absolutely. Yeah, so I would, I you know, yeah. I think regulation is true of our industry. I think there's a number of other factors that has to be taken account of. The one is the cost, risk of failure, and the time from idea to product. All of the other industries you talk about, there is no comparison. Right. All right. And so that's a very different environment. Right. Number one. Number two, and I think this is the point you're making, anyone who thinks that biology and the nature of the interaction between an active pharmaceutical agent and a biological system is a matter of engineering and science and technology doesn't know what they're talking about. It is still an art. I don't think it's serendipity. I think it's an art that goes, right? And the analog, when people say, why is it not so productive, all right, it's not engineering, it's not Boeing, it's not the analogy of if they were as bad as pharma, the planes would be falling from the sky. The analogy is making movies. Most movies fail, all right? Most movies fail. Spielberg will succeed more often than most filmmakers. He's a better artist. It's called a drug hunter, okay? Or he creates an organization which can then create an innovative environment, right? And then the big pharma is the distribution agent. So what they're really good at is not development per se, it's worldwide phase three, turn the crank, okay? So I, in that sense, there is an in ecosystem of different contributions, but these grandiose pardon me, academic statements talking about, you know, innovation in pharma, this is not taking account of the nature of product development, the cycles, the investments, the demands of investors, they, all right, and also the nature of the inquiry and how it is fundamentally different than what we see in high tech. Well, I, I, I freely concede that, that you know, chemistry, as I, as I mentioned to you, is my worst subject in school, and my dad was a physical chemist. So forget that, chemistry. take on the other parts but, of no, my no, no, argument. No, 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 but I am going to take on the other part, because, because I, I, I'm going to take your Spielberg and raise you a, a Reed Hastings. You know, if you, can't, if you can't be a Spielberg, then I want to be Netflix. Mm -hmm. I want to be Amazon Prime. If, if what you're saying is you, you have to bake in the luck and bake in the serendipity or the outsized talent, that. okay, then, mm -hmm. then all I'm saying is I'm looking, we're talking business model terms. I, I'm going to not invest in the, I, I, I can't take a chance that this is the quote unquote the next Spielberg or the next uh, Francis Ford Coppola because we're here in San Francisco. I want to invest in an Amazon. 
I want to invest in a Netflix. I want to invest and talk about a technology disruption. Netflix went from literally mailing out CDs to streaming. That's about as disruptive as you can bloody well get. To you creating know, and, amazing content. And, and the, which is exactly where I was going. So here they are. Right. They're, they're, the, they're, they're the conversion of novelty into that. They're funding their own shows. Right. On this. And what's the difference? They're doing data-driven aspects because they've, they've instrumented the, the stream, the, the feedback. They've built recommendation engines. It's all there. And it, 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 it hues quite nicely. Not that I want to suck up with your model of design. These are designed. These are designed user experiences. But right. if we're talking in terms of innovation and business model, who's going to be the Netflix of pharma as opposed so, to the exactly. Spielberg of pharma? So, so <laughs> I, I, I'm going to respond to that and actually use J and J as an example there you go. of that, and please correct me if I am understanding this incorrectly, because I would love to find out more. But if your argument is that it's really hard to find Spielberg, so you should have a wide net, do a lot of different things, and disrupt by doing a lot of different things, that is the direction that pharma is going in. Right. Right. Right now, historically, 30 years ago, pharma would invest vertically, internally. Right. They do the early stage, they do all the discovery, they do what now is considered contract research work, which is outsourced work. They do that in-house as well, and they go through this process. And more and more, over this period of time, pharma has left go certain facets of what they do internally. And today, we are at a point where large organizations are investing heavily into not only internal projects, but external. I look at j, &J Innovation as a way for j, j to interface externally with sure. with the community at large, PNG, they are connected and developing. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's no, the no, wrong. No, it's similar, but it, there is a deep difference. I mean, just to come back to it, sure. between the kind of analogies we're referring to and the differences that are just between you and me, right. this far apart. Right. Right. And whether or not what we really want to do by intervening in some medical way with some small molecule is truly going to be, you know, something that we have a way to predict by some simple thing that we might do by predicting how much you might like a movie and I might like a movie. These right. are different things. But we're working towards it, right? This is a, a, a certainly a, a solvable problem over a, a, a reasonable period of time where we will get more to the fundamental differences that allow us to personalize care. But we're still a long way away from making that happen very often, except in- Are you in a long way away because of the intrinsic issues of biology and chemistry, or are you a long way away because you're investigatory and innovation and invention infrastructure well, let me, suck. Uh, let me ask yeah. Raj and, and Linda, because I think there's an interesting perspective, because I think we've got a conversation around pharma, mm -hmm. and then we've got an in interesting conversation around therapeutics right. and healthcare, right. and all the other things that are part of the ecosystem. So, I mean, Linda, Raj, you... you so, from, again, I think in this conversation, one of the things that I do agree mm -hmm. on, that I think this is an industry that is um, sort of ripe for disruption. Um, the second common theme is that many of the disruptors that we tend to see in the marketplace aren't the ones who are the incumbents. They're not the traditional. So Netflix was not, um, they're like the outsiders. As was Amazon. Think of, as was Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it was not like Walmart came up with the Amazon concept. Uh, it was um, somebody from the outside. Third, I think it's in our DNA. If, if we think about what really uh, affects companies and industries is that we become very good at what we do, like you were saying, and then that becomes your Achilles heel at the end of the day, uh, as Clayton Christensen so famously started with this whole innovator's dilemma. Um, and pharmaceutical companies have developed a DNA that is enshrined in any but the statement that says... But the phenotype is an Achilles heel. <laughs> the phenotype is not the Achilles heel. We're in the business of discovering, uh, manufacturing, uh, and commercializing innovative, me developing and commercializing innovative medicines. This is, I mean, you can turn around the label, but that's how we define ourselves as. And at the end of the day, our core mandate, as we see it, is to produce radical innovations that fundamentally alter the therapeutic marketplace. Now, if we step back and talk about innovation and invention, we're still in the invention sandbox. And many of us who work in pharma tend to view R&D as the innovation engine. Um, and for a variety of reasons, and some of them that uh, Steve mentioned, regulatory, clinical, those things are actually getting even more onerous. Uh, in fact, the risks and the costs of getting to market with uh, medicines, not to mention the legal liabilities, um, happen to be in depositions as well. After the marketing of a product, you, it's, it's, it's skyrocketing on one hand. 
So when you talk about innovation ecosystems, I come from India originally, uh, moved to the United States. We have five billion people who do not have access to any of the medications, the innovative medications that we talk about. You talk about Amazon and you talk about smartphones, they're diffused, the, diff the rate of diffusion around the world is phenomenal. Um, a kid in a village in India actually has access to Netflix and, and HBO Go and all of those things. We're still in, in, in the stone age when it comes to thinking about how do you get your innovations to the five billion or six billion that have no access to it. Mm -hmm. That's where I think when we talk about invention, I don't want to rock the cradle on invention. I think I agree with you, which is we're very good at thinking about biology and we're very good at thinking about chemistry and we're thinking about novel uh, innovations and interventions. Where we fundamentally fail is from that point onwards in getting that medicine into the hands of those people that benefit the most from it.